Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Tonight, it's just me and Joe. And Joe, what are you drinking tonight? Zombie dust. But I have a backup beer tonight because the well, last couple episodes, so I've got a new Glarus spotted cow waiting for me when my zombie dust disappears. I have a Fantasy Factory, which is an IPA, and I bought it solely on the label, which has a cat riding a fire-breathing unicorn, and the cat has a golden desert eagle in its hand. I I love that beer. For all the reasons. I mean, I often buy beer based on the label, and I'm rarely disappointed, actually. If somebody takes the time to put that much effort into their label art, the beer's probably tasty. It's my, my, oh, yeah. the way I go about it. But that one especially makes me happy. And that's another, you can only get it on the border of Wisconsin and Illinois if you're still an Illinois beer. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So, for news, a uh, printer bot. Uh, had a live stream this week for the prototype of their new belt printer. And we'll have a link to the Twitter post for it. But it looks really interesting. Uh, you want to talk a little about that, Joe? Sure. So I just recent, like, literally just saw that there are videos that I could watch where a lot of the questions that I have about this printer are probably answered. But it's exciting because it, this one seems to be based off of 2020 V-slot. There's a lot of creality parts in this printer so like if you've ever seen a cr10 or an ender 3 you're going to recognize a lot of things like the hot end all the carriages are based off the creality parts and brooke came out and said on the twitter post that he built it with easy to source parts that he had on hand um as a proof of concept printer and they will be uh visiting and different concepts as they get closer to production and how they want to actually produce them. But the goal is to make it cheap, sustainable, and easy to get your hands on. So I'm excited. He said he's going to have one at Earth, um, Ooh. and he's going to be at Earth. So I, I'm excited to see Brooke and uh, see uh, this printer in action. Yeah, they'll, they'll definitely be a decent change for PrinterBot. Yeah. Coming from a you know a history of very novel printers with the folded sheet steel and whatnot. Yeah. So to, to take it, take a step back and I mean, essentially go back to the roots where, cause like there's some laser cut parts on this, but you know, the very first printer bot was all laser cut plywood. Yep. I mean, it'd be nice to see a nice, you know, easily sourceable printer bot again. Yeah, it would be. I'd like to see the 3d printer industry get back to the weird. You can build it yourself printers. That'd be fun again. Complexity for complexity's sake, printers. Those are my favorites. <laughs> and in other super cool news that I am excited about, but I'm not really sure why I'm excited about it, uh, is the BeagleBoard uh, Foundation released the BeagleBone AI, which is just super slick. Um, it's the fastest, most functional BeagleBone board that they've released. It's mechanically and pen out. Uh, compatible with any of the BeagleBone black capes, but it is substantially faster. And the only reason I'm not ex sure why I'm excited about these things is the only thing I ever do with single board computers is try to run a CNC machine off of them because I don't know what else to do with these things. I'm bad at software and code. And <laughs> so, Joe, this is for getting AI to your edge. What's your edge look like? To my To my edge? Yeah, man. Like, I, dude, so many edges just don't have the AI yet. I'm, I'm, I'm so confused it's way, right now. AI is so much at the center right now. <laughs> now, honestly, I'd really like to have one of the guys from the Beelboard Foundation on to talk about these things and what can be done with them and what they've seen be done with them. Because yeah, my, my main experience with single board computers is always just trying to drive a CNC machine off of them. And sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm drastically disappointed. Yeah, I really just need to learn more about machine learning in general. We seem to be in a golden age of AI and artificial intelligence. And I have a very minimal understanding of how any of that works. And I feel like I'm at a disadvantage for not knowing. So that might be on my list of things to learn next year. Uh, speaking of coding, Coraline Ada Emke the 
woman who brought you the Contributors Covenant, which is the code of conduct for open source projects. She just released today the Hippocratic License in the wake of the No Tech for Ice tech movement, where there's a lot of um, tech employees that are retaliating and protesting against the ICE concentration camps. And this is kind of following that wave. It is an ethical license for open source projects. And uh, on the main website for this license, um, she makes some statements on how software is inherently political. Because in the current open source climate, if you're giving your project a GPL license or an MIT license, you're giving the end user license to do whatever they want with your code. So say you're writing some code for GPS software. You know, it, it's getting used in you know, Google Maps so you can get around your neighborhood or get around a city you're not familiar with. You're developing this code to help people navigate and to help make lives better for the people who don't know how to get around places. But what you did anticipate was your code being used in drone strikes to navigate drones around different countries. What she is saying here is that you are responsible for that code since it's you know it was your library or it's your code that you wrote, even though you didn't really anticipate that happening or you know that's not why you wrote it. You see your code out there saving lives and helping people out, and then all of a sudden you find out your code's out there bombing villages. <laughs> it's yeah. it's different. It's a it's a different use. It's rough. This is the start of an approach to solve that problem. So it's based off the MIT license, if you're familiar with that, which is just a very permissive copyleft license, which just says, use it for whatever you want. You don't even have to credit me. So it takes that and adds one stipulation. You cannot use this software to harm others. And it's got a little paragraph giving a little bit of explanation, but it's still very vague. And currently the big discussion for it is that it's too vague meaning it won't be enforceable. You know, people thought the original open source licenses wouldn't be enforceable to begin with. Right. And, and here we are, and, you know, GPL, a lot of those licenses have actually been held up in court. This is just the beginning stages of a brand new license. Yeah, so I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah. And we actually had a discussion about setting up our, our own license last weekend when we were at Milwaukee Maker Fair. I vaguely remember this. Refresh me. How, were, you, were you too deep into what our license is going to require <laughs> at this point? Probably. So, so it was based on the, the buy me a beer license or, or whatever that is. The license that basically says you can use my software or my design for any purpose you want. But the only stipulation is if you see me out and about, you have to buy me a beer. Beerware. Beerware license. Yes. I'm still a fan of that. Yeah. I can't remember what our modification of the license was. We can just do the same thing. We can just, you know, fork MIT. Yes. You can still do whatever you want with it. Just buy us beer when we're in person. I can't remember what it was. It was it was such a good discussion, you know, that was had <laughs> with beer. Uh, man, maybe it wasn't a good discussion. You probably noticed that you there was a gap in episodes with us last week. And... Um, Frankly, that's because we spent three days together in Milwaukee at the Milwaukee Maker Fair in the Milwaukee Maker Space. It was a lot. It was a lot of fun, but <laughs> it, it, it was it was very draining. It was a long weekend. And but man, so now that you've had a week to process, Aaron, give me your thoughts, because this was your first event of this type that wasn't ran by us. And we also weren't exhibiting. At it. So like. Murph didn't count because we were exhibiting. Maker Fest doesn't count because we run it. Like so, as, as a pure participant that just went to go see the greatest show and tell show on earth and spent two days having fun, I definitely see your vision for Maker Fest. They had the the hall on the far right that had all the artists doing stuff. Mm -hmm. The far left hall had all the STEM type stuff, science stuff. And then in the middle, they had the, the dark room with all the, all the light shows and all that stuff. That, that was really cool. Yeah, it was. I, I can really see the blend of the art and the make there. So I can definitely see what you're shooting for with our MakerFest here. We just need to get more makers, I guess, in yes. our MakerFest. Yeah, we do. 
Ignite and Maker Fest is too leaning on the art, just because it's the bigger thing that we have currently in Peoria. Yes. It's not too leaning on the art. It is more heavy towards the arts because yeah. we have an incredibly established arts community in Peoria. And our maker community, it's just hard to get excited about things. <laughs> like we have, an, a, we have a really great maker community. It's just trying to convince them to pack all their stuff up and bring it out for an event. They don't understand why. And then everybody <laughs> who does, they come and they're like, this was incredible. I am coming for every one of these. I can't believe I've never been to one. And I'm like, yeah, I know, right? I can't believe you've never been here too, jerk. Yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at. And I'm glad that you get the vision now. It, it makes me very excited mm-hmm. that um, I finally can... I don't ha- have to uh, explain that anymore to you. <laughs> I'm glad that yeah. Chris was able to see it too. Chris is working in some distant land right now so he can't give his thoughts but both aaron and chris made it up and i was super excited to have them both in the in the place and be able to see both milwaukee maker space and the maker fair and really wrap their minds around what could be the maker space is awesome yeah yes i have things to say about that when we get around to it ah i think we're around to it all right <laughs> so the main topic of tonight is space feel. Uh, it's been something I've been kind of looking at at our space at River City Labs for um, about a month or two now. Now that we're mostly settled in, I'm trying to get that feeling back of when we were at the old space. Because mm. there's a very distinct yeah. feeling that was lost in the translation of going to the new space. Yes. In one of our meetings, one of our officers brought it up. And she just has really great insights when she speaks up. So I'm, I'm, I'm always really ecstatic when she has things to say. And she said that our old space, Thursday open nights, always felt like a party. Because everybody was like upstairs with folding tables just hanging out. Um, we would have either music going or we'd have a movie up on Plex on the projector. We had that big garage door in the back that was always open. Yeah. Mostly because we didn't have any air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. But like all those things, it was like an, it, felt, it was more of an open air environment and people just hanging out. Whereas now we're in a much more formal, more professional maker space. Uh, we have a nice clean area with, you know, workbenches and the printers and stuff and then a, a dirty workshop area. But it feels a bit too on purpose. Yeah. I should say. So one thing I've been trying to study and, and, and look at is how does the space feel to me and to others? And when we were at the Milwaukee Maker Space, it just felt great. Mm-hmm. It had great space feel. Yes. It takes a bit to look at it and figure out what is it that makes it feel good. And I've got a couple things. But do you have, do you have anything you want to add real quick? Um, I, well, I can add an anecdotal experience that I had where I brought somebody into two different maker spaces and they gave comments. Is, is now this time? It's now the time for that anecdotal experience. Um, I'm not going to name names, but this person has been to maker spaces all around the world. And he came to benchmark Peoria as a place for maker spaces stuff. Okay. And I gave him mm-hmm. a tour of the Caterpillar Maker Space, the corporate maker space that I put together. And I gave him a tour of River City Labs. And we went to River City Labs first. And this was the time where River City Labs didn't have a front door. So mm-hmm. were you around when we had to go in through the back garage door? No. Okay. So this is before your time. I joined when we had tarps over all the windows. Well, that was that was this time too, but uh, <laughs> there was a point in time where we didn't have the front door because the sidewalk was gone. It was like a six foot deep pit, and you had to go in through the back garage and traverse all the cars and walk across boards that were bridging pits, like very treacherous. Oh yeah, video game levels yeah, of yeah. death and. <laughs> 
you know, then go all through the front of the space, which we didn't have at the time. We didn't have the lower space. And then go upstairs and go up to the maker space, which didn't have doors or windows either. That was all tarps. And we finally got him into the space. And this whole time I'm joking and like kind of embarrassed, but also kind of loving that we're bringing these people through that run these corporate maker spaces that cost millions of dollars to put together. And the whole time he's just blown away. One, that we would have a maker space in such a crazy place. But two, all the stuff that was that our landlord had, uh, like old English cars and signs from around the world that just gave the space this like super eclectic, crazy feel. And then he gets up into our maker space and he's he walks in. He's just like, you guys just love this space, don't you? Everybody who comes here and is part of the space is in love with this space, aren't they? And I was just like, yeah. That's that's kind of what we're going for is everybody's in love with the <laughs> space and you know so far we're we're making it. He's like, I can tell. I I can tell everybody loves to be in this space and everybody that's here wants to be here. There's no nobody that's half assing it in this space. And then we go directly from that to the ultra clean, ultra perfect caterpillar corporate maker space that we put together. And he walks in, and the first thing he says to the managers is, nobody uses this space, do they? Hmm. He's like, you've got like two or three people that use the space, and they're probably standing in this room right now, right? And the managers were like, well, yeah. And he's like, (laughs) if you look around, I can tell you why. Because the space is sterile. It's got no feel. It's got no love. it's It's got nothing. There's not even a speck of dust anywhere. Why would anybody want to make it? anything in here they're just afraid they're gonna screw things up and everyone's gonna point to him and be like you made the mess and he turns around he's like your space you can tell people love it it's chaotic and crazy but it's organized and you can still make things and it's you can tell everybody in the space loves it because of how the space is built and put together and that like gave me this warm feeling because i've been telling people that for months this is why nobody uses the space Hmm. so the things that made the old space great was the, the the big back door, the big garage door. So it felt very open. We It was an old brick building. So we had like exposed brick, which had a ton of character. Mm-hmm. We had like plywood floors that we'd put down. So we like painted them alternating colors, like stripey colors. So that was really fun. And then we had license plates screwed into the floors uh, for the seams. All of that stuff. And then our landlord had murals painted on the walls. Yeah. And like we had parts of um, organs on the walls as decorations, like the, the hammers. If, that was that was fun and strange. Yeah, so it had a bit of a weirdness to it, like the, the, the eclectic art decoration stuff. Then you go to our, sp- our, our new space. It's, it, it's brand new to us. We've got all of, all of our stuff in there, but we go from the nice old brick, you know, walls to all drywall plaster. All white, all kind of whitewashed. Well, we painted everything white when we came in. Yes, it's white. Yes, it's white. Our floors are are a nice interlocking vinyl tile, so it's easy to clean, but it's kind of boring. Our shop floors are all concrete, which is really nice, but they're also just, you know, flat concrete. So the big thing for me in our our current space is that the main working area, like we call it the clean area, it's very echoey because of the blank walls and the blank ceiling and the blank floors. The echoey, I think, adds to a sterile feel, Mm -hmm. almost like a laboratory type feel, which is one thing I did not get at the Milwaukee space because they had carpet. And the carpet, I feel, did a lot to absorb all the echoes. There was was like close to 100 people in that space when we were there. Yeah. And it didn't feel like it. It didn't sound like it. I mean, all that noise is being absorbed by things. Yes. And that's what I, that's one thing that I want to try and replicate at our space is a bit of a homey feel. Like you could be anywhere with anybody in that's in, in our space and it won't feel like you're out of place and you, you'll just feel at home and you'll feel comfortable. Right now it feels a little bit clinical. It feels a little bit, um, it's hard to find a comfortable place in the space. So if you're there for a long time, like I was there for like almost an entire day a couple of weeks ago. And it was just, it was hard to find a spot to sit down that was comfortable. 
I think I think we need to find a way to add a couch into the space somewhere. I don't care where, even if it's in the recording studio, but just a place that you can like crash for 20 minutes. That's comfy and have a conversation or whatever. I think that would be a good addition to the space and more art, more crazy. Definitely more art. And it's we're getting there. Yeah. I think it's just because we were in that in that other space for several years. We had plenty of time to... Also, the old landlord just had artists, you know, filtering in and out all the time. Yeah. So we just had people just randomly just paint murals and uh, stick Legos in the mortar of the bricks. Well, that, that was just, the landlord. <laughs> <laughs> so we're starting to get there. We, we've started uh, an art wall where we have all these old circuit boards that we screw, screw up on the wall and... Someone took one of our old laser tubes, added a strip of NeoPixels behind it. So now we got rainbow laser tubes going. Yeah. Uh, Sam uh, mounted the helmet mounted condiment shooter that I did for a 24 hour hackathon with a couple other members. That's now up there. So I think the weirdness will come. It will. It definitely will. And like, you know, when we moved to the space, we also changed officers right at the Mm -hmm. same time. And yep. the officers had a different way of operating the space than the previous officers, which I think changed the feel of the space a little bit. You know, there was more of an expectation to clean up after yourself and not just clean up after yourself, but leave the space extremely clean. That was kind of beat down a little bit for a little while. And I think that left the party feel hard to get to again. Because mm-hmm. people were less comfortable being in the space. With a makerspace, I think we constantly want the space to just be a place that you want to be, right? Whether mm-hmm. it's making or spending time with your friends or just being alone and trying to be inspired. And it's hard to do that when there's this potential of somebody coming behind you and being upset that you didn't do this one chore perfectly right. Yeah, you, know, you threw an aluminum can in the wrong garbage can. Mm-hmm. Like, and now that we're we we've kind of backed off of that stuff quite a bit, and the space is getting more and more comfortable to be in. I think people are more comfortable um, being themselves in the space, and that they're not going to get hounded about something. The old space was a mess, a ton. Like it was constantly a mess, right? And mm-hmm. so. We changed that mindset when we left of like just letting things slide to, you know, now we're going to be really on it and we're going to make the space as clean as possible all the time. Right. And I think now we've kind of hit that middle ground now where people get the expectations, uh, but we're also just not going to hound people about it, too. Mm hmm. Am, am I wrong? No, no, you're absolutely right. This this is. This is me being not an officer for nine months and finally giving enough of a crap to come back and like take a look at all this stuff and how things are running and how I'm seeing things go now. Yeah, this is Joe not being president for nine months and now all the machines work. Hey, you know, whatever. (laughs) Most of the machines worked before we left. So, (laughs) um, yeah. Yeah, so one of my things that I want to work on soon is uh, some sound absorbent panels. If you look at some of the like recording studio forums, there's some like easy plans for like one by four frames, and you put some of the rock wool type insulation in it and cover it with burlap. Yeah. And that will absorb and isolate a lot of those uh, sound vibrations. I'm thinking that will help a lot in our clean room to kind of kill some of those echoes. And make it feel, give it that homey feel without needing to add dirty carpet. Yes. And stuff like that. We should just put more stuff in the space. More stuff equals more sound editing. More, more angles for the sound to bounce off of the less echoes we've got. (laughs) No, I was actually thinking about the, uh, the sound panels. Now that, now that you and I have an introductory idea on how to screen print. Yes. We could screen print the burlap. That goes Ooh, on sound panels. I like it. Do custom stuff. I like it. Yeah. Also, I think we should spray paint the floor. Like spray paint a big RCL logo on the floor. Laser cut a big stencil. Should just do that one day and have everyone come in and be like, what happened? 
Because <laughs> we added that floor. Like, that's not part yeah. of it. I think we totally could. I'm kind of on board for it. Excellent. Just take that first take take that first step to, to fuck up the floor. Yeah. You know, it's, now it's like it's already fucked up. You can't you can't make it any worse. You know, it's like when you buy a new car and then you walk out and you hit it with a hammer to put that first dent into it so you don't care mm-hmm. anymore. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> At the same time, I I think it's important to understand the feel you're going for in your space too. Because mm-hmm. I've been to uh, the more clinical lab feel maker spaces, things like um, M Hub um, and like what Tech Shop used to be, and you know, there's nothing wrong with them, but they definitely have a different mindset with their members. You know, they, their members are there to accomplish tasks, not be part of their community, right? You know, they're they're there to gain investment so they're attracting a specific type of crowd versus we're a community maker space where we want a more specific type of crowd we want people like us that just want to come and join the community and be part of the bigger picture you know, they want people to run businesses out of their maker space and to uh, bring up the next big product out of their maker space which is you know a totally appropriate goal it's not the word I'm looking for, but hmm. also valid. Yeah, that's what I'm also valid, but different, very different from what we're going for. So here's a question for you. So we just had a, oh, I was hoping Chris would be here tonight, but we had. We always hope that. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, Chris had his first uh, uh, cosplay guild meetup. Oh, and it was so good. Week. Such a good turnout. We had like, like 40 people show up to that. It was insane. Yeah. So that's part of what I'm, what I'm going to ask you is, luckily with this new space, we're getting a lot more foot traffic in, a lot, a lot of new people, which, is, which was the goal. But now we're getting people that aren't, they're not part of the gang. They're not in, in the main, you know, click of the space. And I'm already now starting to see, you know, subgroups within the makerspace. Clicks. So we've got a, like we've got our main the people that have been here for a couple of years. And then now a couple weeks ago, a group of older people came in. I recognize them, but I didn't know their names. And that made me feel bad because I'm trying to learn everybody's names to, you know, keep that, keep that community feel. But I didn't know them. And they just kind of came in and then started talking about their projects at a table. It's so like they already were there to do a thing and they're, you know, discussing it. And now we had this cosplay meetup and I have never felt so out of place in the makerspace before. Oh man, yeah. Like everybody's talking about their their cosplay, their costumes, their the things they're making and talking about anime, which I, I watch some but not not a ton. And I've never felt so out of place before in the makerspace. Like the thing that I love the most, I just I feel like I didn't belong. Yep. So that was a weird night for me too. <laughs> so long long question now that I give in the context. We're we're getting to a point where we're going to start seeing more people that aren't just like in our main group. Mm-hmm. We're getting these sub these subcultures, these sub clicks in the space. As an organizer, I feel like we can no longer reliably, you know, do the informal communication type thing because not everybody's as familiar with me as like you are, and as I am with like a lot of other inner circle members. We're getting people in that. You know, they might have their own group of friends at the space and they come and do their thing and leave, but they may or may not be in Slack all the time. You know, they may not know how much I joke on things, Mm -hmm. you know? So now I have the responsibility to now be much more formal in my official space communications with things. Yep. (laughs) What are your thoughts on that is my question. I hate it and I love it. (laughs) So, um... I think RCL is definitely at a point where we have to start making hard decisions on how the space is ran. We meaning you, not me. Uh, hmm. But, you know, there's makerspaces across the country that have hit this point where we're at right now and, you know, have made decisions that were controversial. Uh, there's one in Detroit that they capped their membership at 35 members 
and because they knew everybody, everybody got along and they said no new members unless X, Y, and Z criteria are met. And it's basically impossible to become a member there. Um, you have to like know personally no two members they have to vouch for you and then you have to be unanimously voted in by everybody else it's crazy um but you know there's space works because everybody knows each other and so there's no infighting clicks and craziness like it's one big click i rcl is definitely at the point where you know i was jibing you this week about training on the laser like you oh yeah you did I, I, I I didn't I didn't mean to get you fired up. I did, but I didn't. Mean to. Um, you know the you were having issues with the laser not turning on, and the e stop was tripped, and you didn't know to untrip the e stop. And I was like, oh, it's a training issue. Or Fred said that, and then I I jibed you. And um, you know that's it's little things like that now where, like you said, our training is very tribal everything mm -hmm. in the makerspace is very tribal and, and it's yep. we're getting to the point now where if we're to the point where you and i the two people that are in the space probably the most don't know everybody now things have to be official mm -hmm. so publicly voiced things can't be sarcastic anymore and instructions have to be followed policies like door codes have to be followed you can't just like let things slide anymore and that sucks, but it's awesome because it means that the organization is healthy and it's growing. It sucks because it's work for the people that have volunteered to do the work. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and we're not to the point where we're like crazy official yet, but if yeah, it's not if yeah. things like the cosplay guild where we had literally forty completely cold new people show up, if everybody showed up and signed up that day, that would be an org change overnight because we'd be literally doubling the membership that day. And that was a serious possibility that day. I was actually genuinely concerned. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, it was just like I had always said when I was president that if somebody tried to donate like 30 grand to the makerspace, I tell no because of how it would fundamentally change the space. Like, such a major injection like that, either through membership or funds, would change the space so dramatically that it could kill the space. Yeah, it's that's a that's a hard one. That's like a nom group discussion. Nation Nation of Makers for the uninitiated, like where all of the presidents of maker spaces conglomerate and give their opinions on things. That's a that's a hard org question. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah. I, th I think I think we've made the right decisions in the past few months to you know get the new wiki set up, which now requires like no tech skill to contribute. So it's just an account. It's all web based. You make an account and just sign in and do the thing. Stuff like that. We can now start documenting all of those weird things that were tribal. Yes. You know, like make sure you check the e stop. Like I was never told that. And I've never had to do it up until now. So I just didn't realize it. I think we've had one formal laser class. I didn't realize we had an e-stop. It's the <laughs> biggest like, you... button on the control <laughs> panel. It's in the dead center. <laughs> Sounds like, Aaron, did you check the e-stop? I'm like, I don't even think it has one. <laughs> it's like a three-inch bright red button. But, you know, um, Jay was joking with me the other day. We have this big turtle... Um, thing that you like put your face in and take a picture with it. And it's like human size because, you know, we built it for Baker Fest. Um, and I was asking him if it's still in the space. And he's like, Joe, it's hanging on the wall in the metal shop area. It's the biggest thing that's hanging on the wall and things just become scenery, right? After you see them for so long and you don't interact with them, they're just there and you don't, you don't notice them. And, like, if you've never used the e-stop, it's terrifying that you didn't notice it. But, you know, I, I guess I could see that, maybe. Um, on other machines, our e-stops don't work. So maybe that's why. <laughs> those those machines aren't fully operational, just to be clear to the people that are listening to this. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we're t I feel like we're taking the right steps to set us up for success down the road. 
Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to set us up what while I'm here, I'm trying to redo our, our infrastructure at the space to minimize the amount of technical skill and knowledge required to do anything. Um, because we had a WordPress server for the website. Now it's all going to be in that Hugo site that I made, which if you need to change the text and stuff, it's just a, a configuration text file. You don't have to you don't have to know how to code. Yeah. Um and now we've eliminated a WordPress server install. We've eliminated a server install, server hardware, networking, routing. All that stuff has now been eliminated. The wiki, same sort of thing. You know, it's uh, cloud managed now. So there's no more server and stuff to manage. And we're working on replacing our server stack at the space. We have some commercial rack servers. We're, we're talking about swapping them all out for pies. They're raspberry pies. loud. <laughs> So yeah, for one loud. thing, they're very loud. Yeah. And I'm not convinced that a Pi isn't faster. <laughs> they're pretty fast, but... For what we're doing, we don't need that stuff. We don't need this, that big a server. But then, you know, anybody... M- most most makers and hobbyists know how to flash software on a Pi. Yeah. So the, the idea is for any of these services we need, you know, someone more technical can set it up, configure it, get everything set up, take a backup image of it, but then on our Google Drive, now anybody who knows how to, you know, use Etcher can just flash a new SD card, slap it in, you're good to go. Stuff like that, we're trying to streamline in. I think the biggest thing that we need as a space right now is a good onboarding process. Because our onboarding process is horrendous, right? Yeah. Now. Like, it, it's not horrendous, it's non-existent. Like... Yeah. Somebody signs up for a membership. They may or may not get an email. Yeah, they get an email. But oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me tell you about our onboarding process as someone who's been dealing with it for the past couple months. <laughs> so you, you, you sign up on our website. You make an account. You may or may not actually follow through and pay for a subscription. What happens is that in Slack, all of those emails get routed to a channel. We get an email saying, hey, a new new user registered an account. Sweet. Let's hope they make a payment. <laughs> so now we're manually waiting for two emails to come through. If I see that payment email come through, now I manually send them a Slack invite and say, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. As far as I'm aware, there's no way to automate the Slack invites. Probably not. But there is yeah. a member at our space that could probably tell you. Maybe. Apparently, he sucks at Slack. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said the other day. Anyways, so that that is all manual. And we've had so many new members in the past couple months that I just missed a couple. And oh, luckily, like, luckily, there's other people watching the channels. And so they've seen some of them. But it's all manual. And, you, and we're all hoping one of us catches it. And then from there, it just becomes, hey, I need, I would like to be trained on this or that. Is anybody available? Yeah. And then, and then it just becomes all manual and tribal at that point. Yep. So that's one thing I'm starting to look at is how can we automate some of that? Because I'm doing a lot of manual things and it's, it's not sustainable. Hmm. I have terrible ideas. I know you do. There are ideas that probably won't work. I have lots of good ideas. <laughs> Screw you. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I think onboarding is huge. The, there's a, a couple of spaces that I've been to that I've gone to their like new member nights and you know, they have a really nice guided tour. And then afterwards they've got a cool introduction to the space and like a little talk. And, you know, they, they run that every week and they get like five new members out of that every week. You know, that, and that helps with their attrition. You know, that I, the big problem with that is, you know, manpower the normal problem with a maker space but mm-hmm. uh, or people power yeah people power yeah <laughs> humans doing things power yeah i'm really looking forward to finishing up this printer bot build so i can start trying to do some space automation so i think i think there will be some way i can automate that onboarding process i already I'm, i've already got some some gears turning in my head on how to automate some trainings through like you know, videos or guides and then having some sort of Google form based quiz. Yeah. And if you pass a quiz then maybe just do like a run through with someone who's trained just so they can have it, have it still have a human component to it. Yeah. And maybe we should do the video stuff like as low tech as possible. 
like you and I run through something and we one of us is just videoing it on our phones and that gets uploaded to Google Drive immediately with no editing and we see how it goes. And it's just like 20 minutes of us shit talking each other <laughs> on about the East app. And then in the guide, it's like fast forward from minute 10 to minute 20. <laughs> no, and no, then... <laughs> like we, we, we put a concerted effort into to no shit but talking. Um, but no, like, you know, Seriously, you, you get my point, though. Like, as low oh, yeah, effort yeah. as possible, and we see how it goes. And if it goes good, we get feedback, and we make it better. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking we can easily do that for the 3D printers. Yes, and the laser. Like, the process and the, the process is easy enough. The technology is safe enough that we, we probably wouldn't kill the space yeah. if someone didn't follow the instructions. But that'd be a, that'd be a safe technology to try. It's also, like, the most one of the most popular equipment there at the space that could be automated yeah as far as training goes there's like four machines off the top of my head that we could just do in a night so like printers vinyl cutter lasers and large format plotter we could just knock all those out could and we qr code it and we're good and then we say try to use these based on these guides and then our members tell us that we're idiots (laughs) you know not all cameras can read the qr codes are you saying that your phone can't read the QR codes because it can't focus? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even when it could focus, it couldn't do it. Really? Why not? My phone can. It's a OnePlus 5. I just have to download an app. Oh, well, I'm using the open camera app. Well, yeah, you have to, you, you have to download a specific QR code scanning app. I think the new Google camera will do it. Yeah, but that's a Google camera. Well, you're the, literally the only person that doesn't use the Google camera. <laughs> yeah, I use open camera. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyways, I was thinking we could just, you know, just slap the actual URLs on the machines because that includes the wiki. So then and then it's additional advertising for the wiki out Who's there. Who's going to type in that 36 character URL? It's <laughs> like, like I literally I literally went to an art gallery this week and the um, the woman who put together the art gallery, I was so excited to see. The videos of how she did this stuff, it was progressive relief carving. So, like, she would do a print of, a of like, a blank background and then go back and take the uh, pattern that she was printing with and carve more wood out. And then do another print of a different color and then go and carve more wood out to give more detail and then do another color. It's super cool. I wanted to go watch her YouTube videos. You know how she was giving her YouTube link? It was a printed piece of paper with a YouTube link on it, on the wall. Well, well, Joe, yeah, that sucks. And it's like YouTube.com slash 78ZY89. Yeah, that's awful. (laughs) I'm like, no. But if you just go to wiki.rivercitylabs.space slash 3D printers slash Final Cutter. Nobody's going to do that. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I was wrong, but I'm not. (laughs) <laughs> we can do both. We can do both. Yes, we totally do. Yeah. I, I would say we should try to do this Porque on Thursday. Porque no los dos. <laughs> I was going to say we can try to do this video on Thursday, but. I think we should. Yeah. No, Joe. We've got like so much Earth stuff to do. We, yeah. we have we have a hundred koozies that we have to do something with. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a printer that I have to build. I made so much progress on that printer. And then somebody gave me new uh, linear rails today that I might use on that printer that I'm really excited about because they take a lot of work out of it. This podcast got long and off topic. Like normal. Uh, <laughs> but no, it, it's about, we're about that mark. Yeah, so we're just very off so topic now. It's time for a last call. Final thoughts. Space feel. Final thoughts. Spaces should feel good, whether they're for making a business or making a community. Your people should want to be there. And if your people aren't there, find out why. And that might be difficult, both hearing it and getting the information. But it's important, right? Yes. I was going to say other things, but then you've summed it all up. (laughs) Say your thing. Thanks for that. Say your thing. No. I was going to say the exact same thing, and then you said it first. You asked me for th- things. You asked me for thoughts. Yeah, well, that's what hosts do. Sometimes you and your friends can be so in sync that they say the things you're saying. That's right. And with that... <laughs> this is the end of the podcast. Damn it. Keep making that's stuff. Line. Keep making stuff. 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 Stuff.
Steph.